any existing flashings, edgings, outlets, vents, or similar devices. That covers a lot of ground just right there, right? That are a part of the assembly. What assembly? Again, this is coming out of the roof assembly category. Shall be replaced where rusted, damaged, or deteriorated. Rusted, damaged, or deteriorated. Shall be, not maybe, not could be. Doesn't say hail damage. Doesn't say fire damage or water damage. It says damage. And codes come into play too. Like I, know I said, don't talk about uh, mold before. Don't ever say the word rot. So if you do open up the walls and you find water damaged walls, you know, or uh, decking, decking, talk about decking earlier on roofs, you know, open up the deck and there's rotted decking. It's, and you, you say, hey, got to replace the decking. And here's our estimate to replace the decking um, because it's rotted. And here's the pictures of the rotted deck. No. Yeah, yeah, no, because the policy doesn't cover rot. It doesn't cover rot. But, but what caused, it's right. And what caused the rot, guys? Water. water. All right. So it's, it's, first off, it's water damaged decking. So it's damaged. It's not rot. It's rot, but it's not rot. My man back here said uh, solid nailable, right? And so they changed it, I think it's called solidly sheathed. Solidly sheathed deck, it needs to be sh solidly sheathed. And what does that mean? That, or nailable, it's kind of the same thing. But what does that mean? That could mean a lot of things. It could be warped, it's not solidly sheathed. You could have too many nails hole, nail holes in it from too many roofs, that's, that's a problem. It could be cracked, it could be broken. It could be water damaged. That is not solidly sheet. But there are actually, one second, two other codes for decking. So that's where I like, give them more reasons than you need. So you have the, you have the not solidly sheet. That's what most people think of when they, when they use. And that is gold, that's a gold nugget. But also water saturated underlayment is not allowed, okay? So first, you're actually required to go all the way down to the roof deck, all right? That's a requirement, that's law. So I know that they're not, I can't imagine there's anybody here that roofs over top of other shingles. And you know what? If there is anybody here that roofs over top of other shingles, I'm gonna ask, I have to ask you to go ahead and get up and leave. <laughs> Welcome back, guys. We're going to get into one of my favorite segments. We're going to get into the code game, the building code game. So it's my intention to simplify this for everybody here. I want you guys to be able to wrap your head around it. I want to un unlock something in, in your brains today. If you're anything like me, this is like a Japanese language. You know, when I, I just could not understand it at all. Um, it seemed like I had to buy all these code books and I had to study all these books, and that's like studying law to me. You know, I just seemed, I couldn't go there in my head. It just seemed too complicated. And what I want to say is, you don't need to have all, you don't need to focus on all the code books. You don't need to have, to know all the codes. There are really just only a handful of the books that you really need, if you're even going to get the books, and there are only a handful of codes out of those that you're probably going to use the most. So what I've done is I've already simplified and, and, and gathered up those most frequently used codes that you'll need. They're in the files. Now I'm gonna help you understand what they mean, okay? Now, I, I, the thing that I, I know that most people don't have a clue about codes. I know they don't. I'm in a lot of Facebook groups. I know some of you guys are too, like industry-specific groups. And there's like guys will be come in there and be like, hey, can you give me the flashing code? We're talking about the flashing. Can you, yeah, or the decking or something like that. Now, can you give me the code on flashing? And, and so, first of all, the question is not like, I could never give him the flashing code based on the question because he didn't ask me the right amount of information. I need to know more before I can give him the code, okay? So I know that that guy doesn't have an understanding about codes or else he would have asked it right. But then I see five, six, seven, eight, nine people coming into the conversation and handing them the codes, okay? So these people couldn't have given them the right codes because they didn't ask the right questions first. You can't just give them, it's not one size fits all with flashing codes, okay? 
So like, for example, I would have needed to know, is that residential or is it commercial? I would have also needed to know where is it located? So if you were to ask me that, I would have followed up with a question, those two questions, right? I would need to know that, and then I could go ahead and give them the flashing code. And I'll, and I'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll break down why that is. All right, so I know that a lot of these codes are not well known. The adjusters, again, we've covered this already, they just don't know about it. Um, the, and and where, would you, where would you find these codes? Like, again, so I have to go buy all these codes, right? And where, and where are the codes? Who produces the codes? Like, I think a lot of people think that cities make their, like, write codes, and this city, or maybe states, have codes. They write codes, and those are the co you, codes you have to go collect. You have to get them from the city or something. That's not the case. Um, you do have to go to the city, but not, not because the city makes the codes. Okay, this, the codes, and I don't care where you're located, you could be anywhere, any state, any city, any county, all right, in this country, and the codes are required, no matter where you are. I don't care how rural it is. I'm going to give you examples. Um, and the codes are only made by one place, as you can see. It's the International Code Council. I don't know if you can quite see it, but yeah, it's the International Code Council. All right, they're the only place that makes the codes, any codes that you need is the International Code Council. So if you were to buy the books, you would go there to buy the books, okay? So now, if, let's, let's go through what kind of codes does the International Code Council have? Well, we see here we got the IBC, the International Building Code, International Residential Code, the IRC, and then we have like International Fire Code, International Fuel Gas Code. We go on down, We've got International Existing Building Code. We have International Energy Conservation Code, the IECC. We have the International Private Sewage Disposal, Swimming Pools and Spa. I mean, I can just go on and on and on. And so, man, that's daunting. How am I going to learn all those codes? How am I going to buy all those books, right? There's more and more and more. And then there's like plumbing and mechanical and electrical. And, you know, there's all, there's all kinds of codes. It just goes on and on and on, right? I think we finally made, look, solar energy uh, provisions. All right. You don't need all these books. I think you see I'm already going there. You don't need all these, but you don't even need to pay attention to all these books. You only, let's simplify it. Let's only focus on three of these books, okay? Really, we only need to focus on, majority of the time, three of these particular books. And those three books are, number one, the International Building Code, IBC. Number two, the International Residential Code, the IRC. Let me skip ahead a little bit. And the third one is the International Energy Conservation Code. By saying we only need three, am I saying, well, does that mean the international existing building code is, no, is not important? No, that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm saying all of them are important. All of them are required. Every code that's in every one of these books are required. It's law, okay? Mr. Juster, you can't make me break the law. All right, but the things that we're going to focus on the most are those three, the IBC, IRC, IECC. Now, IBC, let's talk about that for a second. Whenever I'm using IBC, well first, IBC, International Building Code, you need to understand that this is the foundation to all codes, all codes, the International Building Code. It's the foundation. It's what, it, it is what all of the other codes stand on top of, okay? Like, it, it's the foundation. Now here's what I mean. If you go into the International Building Code and you start reading, if, if you go down the table of contents, there's a section for residential. You go down to that table of contents. When you get there, it's going to say, for everything residential, it's required, but you got to go over to this book to see it. You see what I'm saying? So this does cover all the books in here. But it's so vast that once you get down to those particular subjects, like plumbing, it'll say you got to go over to the International Plumbing Code, right? You get down to energy conservation, table of contents, in this one here, in the, in the IBC, it'll say you got to go over to the International Energy Conservation Code book. Does that make sense so far? Um, so it has a roofing category in it for you roofers here. If it's a commercial job, you wouldn't need to go over to the residential book to find stuff about roofing. If, so anything commercial, IBC is where you want it. That's where you get your information, okay? Anything residential, IRC. 
That's why I, that, that question was wrong that the guy asked in the group, right? Like, well, give me the flashing code. I need to know, is it residential or is it commercial? Because both of them have a roofing category. You see what I'm saying? So that, that's a good example. Of it. Now, so if it's residential, I'm using the IRC. If it's commercial, I'm using the IBC. And then as far as the third book, the International Energy Conservation Code, IECC, I'm using that for all jobs. That applies to everything, okay? So like, you know, you're gonna, like energy conservation code, that's gonna be like um, air seepage and leakage and you know, just like it sounds, energy conservation. It's everything dealing with the building envelope. So the roof cavity and the wall cavities. This would be where you'd wanna be for like, a flat roof requires ISO board, you know, because it doesn't have ISO board. Well, it, it's be, the real reason is because the R values of the roof cavity are not up to code. And so like in this area for um, commercial jobs, and this, because of the climate here, it's R30, right? R30 for commercial jobs, residential R38 for roof cavity and for wall cavities. This, like, so if you're stripping off an old flat roof and just putting on the same stuff, then it's not gonna bring those R values up, you need more. Um, so you'd have to add ISO board, for example, or something else to, to bring those R values up. It's the combined value of the entire roof cavity. Same thing with wall cavities. We, were we saw the siding earlier, and I, you saw I had fan fold insulation on there, even though no fan fold insulation even existed, because we had to add it to bring it up to code. Does that make sense? All right, now, a couple more things. You don't, surprisingly enough, you don't need to buy these books at all. You don't need these books. So that I, I, I kind of misled you, maybe. I had you believe you had to go buy these books. You can if you want. If you're the hardback cover kind of person, I understand. Old school, I'm a little old school. But here, you don't need to buy them because look where I am right now, guys. I could just click on that and watch this. This is crazy. So I see that you, it might confuse it because you know, it's wanting you to pay for something. They do have memberships, like uh, subscriptions that you can use. These are value. I don't use them, but they're valuable because they have like... Um, code experts in there that can give you more insight into certain codes and also case precedents like kind of like legal stuff back to that again like a certain ruling was made in a court and that set precedents for other cases right so a certain uh, determination was made in a building department somewhere in some municipality and that because they interpreted the codes differently than other people did and so a decision had to be made in a peculiar situation that you don't see all the time, and that set precedence. And that might help you, you know, somewhere. But I'm just saying that's, those are the additional things that come with the subscription, but you don't need the subscription, guys. And if you want to make this box go away, all you got to do is just start looking at the codes. So over here on the left, that's all the table of contents of all the codes in the IBC, okay? So like, for example, if we were, since we did mention roof, I know there's a lot of roofers here, chapter 15 in the IBC, deals with all the roof assembly stuff, right? It's chapter nine in the residential one, the IRC. But so like chapter 15, if I click on it, now I'm inside the codes and that box went away and I'm just, I'm just searching codes, baby. You know, I'm here, I'm free flowing. I didn't need to pay for anything. Like, so just watch the, you wanna be at the codes.iccsafe.org. It wants to know your location, I always block that. You know, because that, that, it wants to take you to more specific stuff. I just want the straight up IRC, IBC, IECC, right? You can just start going and you could get into any one of these uh, categories you really wanted to. I mean, you can do anything you want, right? So like, if, for example, I could go in here. Um, I want to get in the other one, actually. So you can see like fire protection, right? Um, energy efficiency, chapter 13. And what I mean is, when I said, look, it's all got to be done, it's all required, but you need to go over to the IECC book to get that stuff. That's what it's saying. It's referring you somewhere else. It's not that it's not included. It's all included in the IBC, right? Um, let me go back one and show you something else. So like IRC, same thing. This is the residential. And if you went down into roof assemblies, the box goes away, and you can just go through and actually search the codes. Now, what I've done is, what my code snippets, I call them, are made up of, like say I needed to, to take a section here and make it a code, and say you don't have that in your files. I use this little snipper tool, 
snipping tool, and there's other ones, you know, screen grab, screen capture on uh, Mac. There's other ways to do it. But I just go up and, like, I don't copy and paste. I want a JPEG image, right? So I just go down through, and that's how all of them are really made. You know, it's a JPEG image now, and I could save it as whatever, right? Keep going with this. Now, one more thing you need to know, a couple more things, but do you see the dates on here, the years? Why is that? Like, that's important. That's very, very, very important. Bless you. And this is where I think people don't have that understanding. So that, that's the thing is like, I need to know uh, other information. It, it says 2021. Why is that? We're in 2022 now. So that's outdated. That doesn't seem right if these are the people that make the codes. Well, what you need to know is those three books that I mentioned, the IBC, IRC, and IECC, are produced and published once every three years. Okay, so there's a 2021 version, 2018 version, 2015 version, 2012 version, 2009, right, 2006, 2003, 2000, on and on and on. So now you need to know the differences between these. Ver now, I will say when they're changed, not a lot changes, just real small little changes. But wherever they notice they may have a more efficient way of, for the code, they'll make a change and the new version will come out. Sometimes there will be significant changes. Like 2012, drip edge re became required. So like if you're any, any 2012 and, and newer and they didn't have drip edge before, they have to have it now and the insurance company has to pay for it as long as they have ordinance and law coverage. Remember that part? OL coverage. They have to have the ordinance and law coverage. Now, you will see though, I don't want to confuse it because you might see like plumbing and electrical. Those are every two years. So you'll see different years on some of these books. You'll be like, wait a minute, I thought Chad said they only come out every, once every three years. Some of them, they're a little different. We're not even talking about those other codes. We're only talking about the IRC, IBC, IECC, and they come out once every three years. All right, so if you see something a little off here, those are probably plumbing, probably electrical. Now, does that mean that those codes are not important? Am I saying you don't need to even focus on plumbing codes or electrical? Absolutely not. That's not what I'm saying at all. Every, again, every code in any of those books are required and they're law, and you as the contractor are responsible for making sure that they're adhered to and complied with. Does that make sense? I mean, you really, I imagine everybody here, if you have some kind of contractor registration in any city, in the state, whatever you have, there's something there that says you're going to comply with all building codes, you know. You've got to know this stuff. This is actually, forget insurance for a minute. You've got to know this stuff, right? Um, all right, now, there's a final component, and this is where it comes together. How do I know which version then to use? Do I just use the most recent version because that's the most recent version? This is the most recent version, by the way. No, that's not. I wish we could because it probably has the most strict codes in it, right? I wish we could just use that one then. But that's not how you do it. You first have to find out which version of the codes is required in the city where you're doing your job. That means that the city has adopted a version of these codes. They've either adopted the 2021, one minute, I know what you're gonna ask. They've either adopted the 2021, the 2018, or the 2015, they've adopted one of these versions. And you gotta go find out which version of the codes has the city even adopted. So before I go do an inspection, that's what I'm doing first. I'm gonna find out which version has this particular city adopted so now I know the rules that govern this particular claim. What I think you're gonna ask, I, I think, and what I'm gonna, I'm gonna see if I can't guess, is that, so I said, it's the city, okay? But what if there is no city? Am I close? No? Hey, you know what? You know what's funny? You know what's funny about that, dude? What's really funny is that. So he said, why don't you just push it through? Just push it through and show them the 2021. It's, it, you, what's hilarious about that is that would actually work. I'm, 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 I'm ashamed to say, but I couldn't do it because then that would be me doing something. Oh, yeah, you know what I mean? Because then I, I can only do it if I didn't know any better, yeah. which is actually usually the case. Back to the Facebook group. This guy's like, hey, can you give me the code of the flat? So what's crazy is this guy, like all these people send me flat, and they use it, and it works. 
because the because the adjuster doesn't understand it either. He doesn't understand how it all works out. Um, so what I thought you were going to ask, which is also one, you know one of the more frequently things that comes up, is like, is that what do you do when there is no city? Because I, I get this all the time. It's like, well, what do you do when they don't enforce the codes? What about what about when that particular city doesn't enforce the codes? No such thing. That's adjuster speak. Okay, and that's a adjuster might have called the building department and found somebody and gave him some story about some. I mean, I got this out of town contractor over here that wants to rebuild the whole house. You know, do you allow that? No, we don't. Allow, you know what I mean? Like that. I wonder how that question was really asked. I have I have a comeback for that particular objection. Um, but so when you start with the city. All right. And if there is no city, like it's a rural unincorporated area, then you'd go to the county. All right. So you, so you go to the city building department first. If there is no city, maybe there's a city but no building department. You know, maybe they don't have any rules. Um, then you'd go to the, co the county next, and you might be in a situation where there's nothing really going on at the county level. They don't have any rules. Then it would be the state. That's rare, though. That's rare. And how do you find this information? Great question. I'm so glad you asked. Let's get to that now. So how you, how you get the information is really quite simple. It's like you get a lot of other information on Google. So I just type in, um, I'm going to do one that I already know. I'm going to cheat a little bit, you know, because this is one I use in all my events. City of Frisco, Texas, because I know right where to go. I don't want to spend a lot of time hunting and pecking. Um, but you would enter in, you could do it with any bill. You can do it now on, on any of them. City of such and such, Colorado, right? Building codes is what you want to say. And stay away from all the other sites. Make sure you're going to an actual official city site. You know, it says it in the domain. But that's what I'd do. I'd search there, and right there at the top, you see adopted codes. That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for adopted codes. What did they adopt, OK? So there it is. The city um, of Frisco, <laughs> look what they're saying. They've adopted. I know what they've adopted. But I can see just from the Google search return that right now, they're currently seeking public comment on the local adoption and amendment of the 2021 international codes. <laughs> Is that like they're getting ready to go? They're upgrading right now. They're seeking comment because that's a process that they go through to make an actual adoption, right? So anyway, I click through to the official website of Frisco, and I could see right there. Well, I need that on city letterhead. There's the city letterhead right there, guys. <laughs> There's the city letterhead right there on the page from their website. I would screenshot the whole thing that shows the domain in the website when they say I need that on city letterhead. That's my city letterhead. That is actually this page is the first image in my estimate. It's the very first image. After the line items, the very first of hundreds of images, this is the image. I'm doing a screenshot of all this that says right there, you can see 2008, I don't care about all the, remember I said, some of them are every two years. The ones we care about are every three years. You can see it right there, what I mean by the every two years. But the ones I care about, remember, are the International Building Code. There it is, 2018, IBC, with amendments. Amendments. I can go click this here. What is the amendments? So they've adopted the 2018 International Building Code, but they've made some additions to it, right? They've decided that they're going to adopt it, but they've, made, they've taken out certain parts and they've replaced it with other things. Like, and it's usually more restrictive when they do that, okay? But you can see this is 40 pages worth of amendments, and this is how it works. They strike through, and then they add to it, right? So they, and you have, uh, that's what the additions look like right there with the underline. They strike through what they're taking out, and they underline what they're adding to it. To bring that home, ice and water shield is required everywhere here in this cold water climate. It's not required in Texas, but in Frisco it is, because Frisco says we adopt the 2018 codes, but we're increasing it on our own. Okay, that's an amendment. That's what an amendment is. Um, but look, so they've adopted the 18 uh, IBC, the 2018 International Energy Conservation Code, that's all I care about, and then one final I want to know about, they've adopted the 2018 International Residential Code. You see? See how that works? Now I know the rules for this particular estimate that I'm going to go do in Frisco, Texas. See how that works? Now, um, 2018 is, like, I will say, you're not going to see a lot of 2021 yet. Some people have it already. Not a lot of them do. Like, even though it's one year back, you're thinking, that's the most recent. And it takes a while for these cities that start adopting things and have a process for everything. So they're usually behind. The older towns and stuff, they're kind of falling apart. You'll find they have older building codes that, they, that they've adopted. 
They're not required to adopt the most recent. You know what I mean? Um, all right, now, so how to deal with the, uh, the, okay, so if I can't find anything here, I would go to the county of, in this case, it's like Collin County. Because you're going to see in Collin County, they also have building codes that they've adopted. But I don't need to pay any attention to this. And the state has codes that they've adopted to, as well. But how it works is it's always the local first. That's what, that's, what is infor that's what is required. It's not the state. So it's the local first, the nearest first. Um, so like the state of Texas could have like weaker code requirements. Doesn't matter to me because Frisco is what trumps that. Does that make sense? All right, good. So any questions on that before I, no? You guys have got it then, great. <laughs> good. I have a folder just me personally, like to do my work, called the, fo called the Code Game. <laughs> it's the name of this subject, right? And this is that, like, you guys can organize however you want to on your end, but I've organized everything in your files kind of like I have it in my, in my, on my computer here. So, all right, open the, I'll open this up. This is the Code Game, my Code Game folder. So based on everything I've told you now, it'll probably make sense to you. I have all, I, now Florida's always a little different. You guys have those too, I put those in there too, but it's the only one where, it's still they've adopted the IRC and the IBC, but they've really enhanced it, like to a whole nother level. So you kind of almost have to put it in its own category. Um, so if you're gonna do any Florida work, that's, there you go. But here you go, you got 2021 IRC codes, residential, 2021 IECC, IBC, right? And the next, 18 IRC, 18 IECC, IBC, 15, right? 12, 9, and then I think 6. I don't really run into the 03s and 2000s anymore, but I've got them somewhere archived. And uh, so you go into like one that we'll see a lot probably, more than, more than others, like the 2018 IRC, International Residential Code. There they are. So you can kind of see just one of the folders you guys have, how many different codes we're talking about, right? Um, and I'll bring up my favorite one, right? Here it is right here. Is this mostly being centered or is there a No, there's a lot of different codes in there, man. And, and like, like if you're doing interior work and water damage, walls, wall sheathing, you know, that kind of thing, um, there's a lot. And the energy codes that come into play a lot. But I think one thing that's cool is that if you can – just wrap your head around this basic stuff and see what they're really, they're, they're meaning and where to find your information at, then for a lot of people that I've encountered in this little segment, they have like analytical minds and engineer minds and they're fascinated by it. And they could, so you can go as deep as you want to go with the codes. You know, like there's code requirements for the, the rafter span, you know, the load, I mean, there's all kinds of different things. Before you know it, you're tearing apart the whole house and rebuilding it again. I don't recommend that, but I, I've never felt the need to do that. But I'm just saying there's a lot of codes. There's a lot of codes for everything. If we take out a wall in mitigation and, and we see a rafter and it's outside the code, then we can apply that. Code. Absolutely. That. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I would focus on those wall cavities too, the energy efficiency in the wall cavity. Like once you open up a wall... You know, there's all kinds of things, man. You know, I hope that I can be the, the one that unlocks something for you to go and make the world yours with the codes. You know what I mean? If the insulation isn't uh, uh, sufficient in the wall, mm -hmm. what do you do to get it up to code? Is it the foam insulation? Yeah, fan fold insulation would be a good one. Yep. Or you, know, you add more insulation, but fan fold insulation, especially dealing, you know, if, if you don't have access from the interior and it's siding, you would add it to the siding. If you're inside and it's not there, you gotta add it from the inside. You gotta add the insulation, more insulation from the inside. All right, so this is, the, this is my favorite code. I just, I just like to pick this one out, <laughs> you know, because it's like I've talked about it before. Existing slate, clay, or cement tile shall be permitted for reinstallation, except that damaged, cracked, or broken slate or tile shall not be reinstalled. That's important too, but that's not what I'm getting at. That just means you can't, you know, take parts from one side of the, and install somewhere else. But, and this is coming out of the roof assembly, right? So we're talking about roofing related stuff. Any existing flashings, edgings, outlets, vents, or similar devices, that covers a lot of ground just right there, right? That are a part of the assembly. What assembly? Again, this is coming out of the roof assembly category. Shall be replaced where rusted, damaged, or deteriorated. 
rusted, damaged, or deteriorated. Shall be, not maybe, not could be. Doesn't say hail damage. Doesn't say fire damage or water damage. It says damage. Aggre aggregate surfacing material shall not be reinstalled. Can't take, you know, that, that's important too, but it's interesting to me how they take something important but not interesting and dull, right, and, some, and put it at the end and put something important but not interesting and put it at the front and pack all that power in the middle of this. I mean, that, that code right there is so powerful. Um, and then, you know, codes come into play too. Like I, know I said, don't talk about uh, mold before. Don't ever say the word rot. So if you do open up the walls and you find water damaged walls, you know, or uh, decking, decking, you talked about decking earlier on roofs, you know, open up the deck and there's rotted decking. It's, and you, you say, hey, got to replace the decking, and here's our estimate to replace the decking um, because it's rotted. And here's the pictures of the rotted deck. No. Yeah, yeah. No, because the policy doesn't cover rot. Doesn't cover rot. But, but what caused. That's right. And what caused the rot, guys? Water. Water. <laughs> All right. So it's, it's, first off, it's water damaged decking. So it's damaged, you know what I mean, itself. Um, it's not rot. It's rot, but it's not rot. Um, all right. So the, my man back here said uh, solid nailable, right? And, and they changed it, I think. It's called solidly sheathed. Solidly sheathed deck. It needs to be sh solidly sheathed. And what does that mean? That, or nailable. It's kind of the same thing. But what does that mean? That could mean a lot of things. It could be warped. It's not solidly sheathed. You could have too many nails hole, nail holes in it from too many roofs. That's, that's a problem. It could be cracked. It could be broken. It could be water damaged. That is not solidly sheathed. But there are actually, one second, two other codes for decking. So that's where I like, give them more reasons than you need. So you have the, you have the not solidly sheathed. That's what most people think of when they, when they use. And that is gold. That's a gold nugget. But also, water-saturated underlayment is not allowed, OK? So first, you're actually required to go all the way down to the roof deck, all right? That's a requirement. That's law. So I know that there are not, I can't imagine there's anybody here that roofs over top of other shingles. And you know what? If there is anybody here that roofs over top of other shingles, I'm going to have to ask you to go ahead and get up and leave. <laughs> This guy got me at one of my events. He's like, yeah, you can do it. It's because it says you have to follow manufacturer instructions. And, and I, I mean, he got me. I'm putting this on YouTube. I bet him $1,000. I was like, I bet you $1,000. You show me that. You prove that to me, that GAF like, allows you to go over top of other shingles. I'll give you $1,000. And he starts, so, I, I'll give you 5000 if you could do it before the end of this meeting. He got me. I mean, like, so I want to bring you. I never was aware of this. Yeah, he got, he got me. I had to pay up, too. I did. I, I, I'm, I'm putting it on YouTube. You'll see it. It's, I'm making it entertaining. Like, I'm going to title it, like, uh, Contractor uh, Exposes Me in Front of 70 Other Contractors and Makes Me $5,000. Um, so he got, but really, it was still splitting hairs, you know? It's like a thing where it says, GAF says, you can go over one layer of shingles but it's not recommended because then you can't inspect and the codes say you have to do this. And so for that reason, you know, it's like pointing you back to the codes and the codes point. So I don't really think, if an adjuster tried to use that with me, I'm slamming them on that, you know. But so now, unfortunately, I have to add that little disclaimer <laughs> about GAF, you know. But no, you cannot roof over top of other shingles. It says, uh, so there's not, so you can't have any, you can't have any more than one layer. Uh, in the codes. Now, GAF apparently tries to give you an out. I don't know who lobbied them for that. Some big building that needed to be, you know, for the, but anyway, uh, so that's one thing. But also, what does it mean to go all the way down to the roof deck? It also means that you cannot roof over top of the old felt, guys. So like I say, I'm going to have to ask you to leave if you roof, but I bet you there's some people here that go over top of the old felt. That is not allowed. That's not allowed. It's against the law. So, like, I've had, you know, contractors and subs of mine back in the day tell me, oh, no, boss, you, you know, it's better. It's more protection. And I've had guys tell me, you get more R value. Great. It's against the law. So I'm not doing it. So um, commercial roofs, you're going to come in across, like, when you run into a commercial roof, 
chances, especially if it's an older roof, chances are when you open up that top layer and they approve the top layer and that's it, and you do a core sample and you get in and you find out that there's all these other layers underneath it. There's tar and gravel and there's, you know, all these other mod bit and different things, maybe a metal deck at the very bottom of it, right? Well, there's water leaks in this roof. So water's getting through to all these different layers. All those layers have to be removed, okay? And most commercial roofs, we know that now, like in most adjusters know that it has to be stripped all the way down to the deck. And then you have to add ISO to bring it back, right? Um, but just, just realize that, that uh, water-saturated underlayment would include those layers of roofing and any felled or underlayment that, that, that there actually is, because those layers are acting as underlayment. That's the second code. So water, can't roof over water, uh, saturated underlayment. But also you cannot, there's another code, it's all in there. You cannot roof over top of water soaked decking. That's in there. <laughs> so it's not rotted, it's water soaked, guys. So it's, it's funny you're talking about this because I just got this job in Steamboat and uh, Eco or somebody. I'm going to come and work where you guys work, man. Yeah, Steamboat, Breckenridge. And so when they sold the house, they looked up in the roof inside that, and guess, lo and behold, there's just black mold from one end to the other. Mm. And I was, then they, then they called the water restoration, well, it was whoever's water restoration company come back out, hey, we, we were supposed to mitigate mm -hmm. this. Well, we did, but the roofers, you know, they started pointing fingers. Luckily, they didn't go to, to litigation. They just, the homeowners just got so much money, they just wanted to get it done. Yeah. But um, I was trying to figure out why the heck did it come back, and it had to have been the roofer did replace, he probably had soaked uh, uh, decking that he just went right over the top of the roof. Everybody does it, man. It's so crazy. Yeah. I'll, I'll, so you, so you can, huh? Can I, I still didn't catch it. Can we rip the roof off and remove the decking then in this case? You can't. But, but the, the, I mean, <laughs> here's what I recommend because I'm all about supplementing before the build, hashing it out before the build. How do you find out? The attic inspection, the attic inspection. Like, I mean, you can't always get to an attic, especially with the flat roof, right? Um, but yeah, the attic inspection is where I would go. On a flat roof, on a commercial, they're usually gonna approve the top layer. I'll do, go do a core sample and prove that the water's coming all the way down. And also, because in th those cases, it's probably gonna be a metal deck, and that metal deck's gonna be rusted at the bottom. That means that deck, here's the thing, here's important. When the deck is water soaked, what do you do? You can't roof over it, so you got to remove it and replace it. Even if it's just the area where it's wet, it has to be cut out, okay? Now, now, once you've done that, you've exposed the roof cavity. It now has to be brought up to code, the roof cavity. That could mean the R values. That could mean, you, know, you, could pro you probably already exposed for, to require the R values. But where it comes into play, what if the decking is only a half inch, guys? Like some of the old decking, half inch? Now it's got to be five eighths. <laughs> so if the decking is all the way not up to code, it, it might be that it's not required for you to replace the decking. But if you find the wet spots, even one, then that particular wet spot has to be cut out. Now you've exposed the deck, the roof cavity. Now it's got to be brought up to code. You see? So like there, there's a lot. And listen, they say, uh, the codes say that you can, you can roof over top of shingles if, if it's metal or spray foam. Like there's certain kinds of things that you can use to go over top. So I have a buddy that's all into spray foam. He's a fanatic, you know, he's, he loves, he's, they have a whole community too. Um, and he says, I can spray foam anything and it will not leak. His whole thing, he's been doing it for years, is go out and take a waterlogged, saturated roof and just spray foam over top of it. And his thing is, and he does, he stops the leak. But man, what's up with the roof cavity now? It's just encapsulated water, you know what I mean? Like so, so and, he, and he says, no, you're allowed, the codes say you're allowed to spray foam, and it sure does, buddy, but not when it's water saturated underneath. So, spray it in a crawl space, so if you, it floods, that doesn't make any sense. I would never use spray foam. <laughs> well, and the other, the other thing too is that if, like, let's say you come across a spray foam job, love them. Love the spray foam job, like that's damaged by hail. And they want you to do like a scurifying, it's called. It's a line item and exactimate. Scurify to like kind of 
grind down the top layer and then you prime it and then you add new spray foam on top of it. That sounds great, Mr. Adjuster. In a perfect world, I'd love to do that for you, but I'm sorry, I can't break the law because it's wet underneath. You know what I mean? So, and then, you know, when we're getting into those level jobs, get your FLIR guns out. You know, we need thermal imaging. We need core samples. We need a lot of documentation before we ever even begin. Um, and I, I don't want to leave out the people in this room that don't do roofs. Okay, because this, this is, comes into play with interior jobs. You're exposing walls all the time. You got windows exposed, and, and it's what? It's rotted or it's termite infested, the things that aren't covered under the policy. But you got to rely on the building codes. And if, if they have ordinance and law, then you have the ordinance and law over, you know, supersedes them not having coverage for rot or any of these other things they want to call it. Does that make sense? Manufacturer specifications are always required. That, and they're in every, every one of those code books, every section of all those code books, it says manufacturer specifi specifications required. So my man Antonio is asking me about ventilation. There's a lot of ventilation codes, and I have some, in, some of them in there. Um, and you make it into the HVAC to learn more. But there's a whole thing about roof ventilation in the commercial and the residential. Um, but that may be too far down the rabbit hole for you. It might be for me. So it might be easier for me to go to Owens Corning, if I'm using Owens Corning or GAF or Certainty, and go to their ventilation specifications. Does that make sense? Because, I mean, they're not going to cover the warranty on the roof if the ventilation's incorrect. Am I correct on that, guys? Like, if you, do, if you ventilate it incorrect, that's not, that voids the warranty. So they have very strict specifications about the ventilation. What I'm getting at is if they don't have the proper ventilation, you've got to add it. That's code. Yeah, well, I, I would submit that they do, you know what I mean? But, but I'm not using the warranty as a reason to do it, you know what I mean? What I'm, what I'm using are building codes, and the building codes require that manufacturer specifications be followed. You see what I mean? Nothing to do with the warranty at all, but I probably just confused it by inserting that part about the warranty, you know what I mean? Um, just keep it basic and simple. Keep it to the, you know, I, I see that's an example of how I can convoluted it and adjuster would latch onto that. You see what I mean? That's what an adjuster would do. They would latch onto that and then they'd try to catch, catch me. I'm like, dude, I never no, said anything. Just ask them to sign off on it. That's what I asked the agent. They're, that, you could ask them that. Yeah, I was going to say, I was going to say, you could ask them that. They're never going to sign off on it. Right. Yeah. So back to your ventilation thing, we, uh, we're up in China, Wyoming, we deal with a lot of older style houses. I saw your orders come through. I was, I'm happy to have you here, man. Thank it's only an hour up the road, right? Like two uh, hours, yeah. hour and a half. Okay. Two at the most. If you live in Aurora, it's two. You got, th there's like three of you here? Two of you? How many of you are here? Uh, well, I work for Calvin Roofing in China, and he works, um, he has his own company in China as well. So just nice. You guys, hang, um, you guys stick close together, right? <laughs> yeah, he friends, and then he went out and decided to do his own. Nice. Uh, <laughs> um, so so the ventilation thing, if you're dealing with an older house, you need to ventilate it because of code. If, in the sense of if you want, because to do, do it right, you put internal vents, ridge vent, whatever, do they have to also go back and cover like soffit vents, siding, all of that stuff? Yes. Okay. Well, let me, let me, Cause I know you, probably, you there could be caveat, yeah. there could be nuances. Yes, you can do it's all one piece. That's right. The whole total of it. And they have vent ventilation calculators on a lot of these. Yeah, yeah. Owens so, Corning or GA, yeah, is a GAF. A lot of them, lot of them like Lomanco, like will do their own. Use that too. Yeah. Use so, that too. Um, then along that lines, how do you, I guess you just reference the code and you cover whatever, whatever your trade is and then they have to still cover if the homeowner decides because there's also something out there called deck air which is still a roofing thing. I personally don't like it. It looks goofy. But if they decide to Oh, I see what you're saying. You're saying, okay, then well then what type of ventilation do yeah, they have to Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I don't I don't think it Does that I think that could be wide open for the insurance company, honestly. Okay. Right? I, I see where you're going. You're like, well they have to pay for ventilation. What type of ventilation do they have to pay for? <laughs> you know what brand, you know? Is it gonna be? I think soffit vent looks better in a house anyways, Yeah. But yeah. They could Mm -hmm. What's the deadline? I think they have to pay for at least the minimum required for the cheapest option out there. You know what I mean? Okay. Yeah. I have one more question for you about the solid sheeted decking. Yeah. So 
Next week we're doing a roofing job, and when I inspected this roof, I felt soft decking and it was warped. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 24 foot or 24 inch span trusses, I believe, with maybe half inch CDX or, or plywood, mm -hmm. and so you can just feel the weight. Yeah. Is, is warping the what I would do is like one thing you could do is set set a pile of shingles on top of it, <laughs> where it's you know bowed out, and take a picture of that too, you know. And show the width, you know, show the width of the deck. But the key is find wet spots, dude. You've got to find the wet spots on that deck so if you before it, you build. If you word it as wet instead of rot, they have to cover wet if it's... I don't even say wet. I say it is water-saturated underlayment and water-soaked decking and non-solidly uh, sheathed. Okay. Because I'm, wor I'm, I'm modeling the three different building codes yeah. word for word. Because we get that all the time up there from space to rot and work. Well, that's another one. Space decking's got to be upgraded. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's, that's you thing, know that. I would make sure you put in for cleaning up the attic and protection and all the whole nine yards for that. Or plank decking, too. That's what I'm yeah. going to deal with the mm -hmm. right now. And the El Paso Building Department is not really standing behind me. <laughs> a couple things, because like, we got to keep moving, guys. I want to, man, we're running out of time. Gee, many Christmas. Where's the time going today? This is fun. We're having fun. Um, I want to, good. I want to, I want to, I want to know. That, is anybody getting some value out of this stuff? Okay, good. Just telling me that. I'm just kidding. All right. A couple questions that come up, like they say, and I brought, I, I referenced it earlier, or I hinted at it. What do you do when they say they don't enforce it? You know, and I, and I started there earlier. So they're saying that, and Justice says they called the building department and found out that they're not enforcing those codes, so none of that even applies. They found their loophole to get out of it. Well, wouldn't that be convenient? That is so much garbage. I mean, and it's amazing that they even try that one, okay? So what I would first do is call the building department. I was in Dighton, Kansas one time. If you guys know where that is, you may, because we're closer to there now. It's southwest Kansas. It's out in the middle of nowhere, man. Dighton, Kansas. <laughs> I'll never forget that place, man. I, had, I, like, I was out there working on a hailstorm. My client had a bunch of sales reps out there. And they only found out about it. There's a huge hail that fell, like baseball size hail. They only found out about it because uh, one of the sales reps' grandma lived out there, way out in the middle. And like, when you go out there, I, I was out there for a couple weeks. I had to stay at a Hampton Inn that was like an hour and a half away. Just to give you an idea, it was really out there. There's no McDonald's in town. Like you would think, even the little small towns I've been, you know, there's not even like a convenience store. It was very, very, very small. And um, the, there's no place to stay. All the sales reps were meeting at grandma's house one day. We had this meeting and I was trying to help their sales reps understand this stuff about the codes, right? And they were like, oh, Chad, they weren't buying any of it. They're like, no, Chad, you don't understand. None of that stuff even matters out here. You know, they're like trying to tell me like, sorry you thought that it did, Chad, but you must not know about Dighton, Kansas, because none of that, even there are no codes out here. You know, you saw driving in all those cows, there's no codes out here. And I said, well, where are you getting? I said, dude, trust me, there's codes. They're, they're, they're required everywhere. He's like, no, 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 trust me, they're not. Okay, because out here, we've got like the 90 something percent of all of our claims are through State Farm bummer you know because like and it was like the same adjuster that they had to deal with too like the same field adjuster you'll find that in rural areas where you just can't get i always say send your stuff to the inside take it above the field never go back to the field adjuster right and in these rural areas they'll send it right back to the same old dude and he's used to all the guys in the area you know um that's what it was and then they said they already tried all this and they went to him and went to the supervisor, the regional manager, who's over top of like four states, or, you know, area, I think Kansas and Missouri and that, like regions, right? But anyway, they said they got to him and he even said, there's no codes out here. And I said, this is, they're crazy, like they're crazy. So I, instead of calling the adjuster and the supervisor first, I'm, I'm set to prove them wrong, right? I'm like looking up on my computer, city of Dighton, Kansas, building codes, nothing, right? And by the way, if you can't find it on Google, this is what you would do. So then I looked up the city of Dighton, Kansas building department. Doesn't exist. I don't think there was a city, you know, so I had to go to the county. I think it was Dighton County um, building codes. And they had a building department. So I found the number. There's no site. There's no, like, city site showing all their codes. 
or county site. So I called the number, and this lady answered, and I said, yes, ma'am, hello. She had, you know, an accent. She was real rural, and, uh, which is okay. I love, I love her. Um, I know how to you know, kind of get right into that. I've lived in the rural area, so I try to fit my surroundings a little bit, maybe make a friend, maybe get farther or something. So she's like, uh, can I help you? I was like, yes, ma'am. If you could help me out, I'm looking to find out, you know, what version of the International Building Code and what version of the International uh, uh, Residential Code and which version of the International Energy Conservation y'all adopt? You know, and she goes, excuse me? She was like, do what? And I was like, and I repeated myself, like, yeah, which version of the, you know, because, and she goes, well, honey, you're going to have to talk to Stan. Let me get you over to Stan. He runs the building department. And so I'm like, okay, I'll ask Stan. So she transfers me over. And you could tell he's on a cell phone, out run, driving somewhere, you know, that she transferred me over, but he's on a cell phone. And he's like, yellow. <laughs> That's how he answered the phone. He's like, yellow. And they're like, not like, you know, this is Stan or whatever. I'm like, yes, sir. Excuse me, can you please tell me which version of the International Residential Code, International Building Code, International Energy Conservation Codes y'all currently adopt? This is the head of the building department. You know what he said? He said, do what? He had no understanding of it either, and he's in charge of the building department the of the county. So you can only imagine how that state farm regional manager got the information that he got, maybe from the horse's mouth, right? So I said, okay, well, I'm real confused. Uh, or, you know, well, I, 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 I asked him, and he goes, well, uh, we don't have nothing like that here. You know, I said, well, I'm real confused. I said, uh, how could you not have any building codes? I go, well, I said, there's building codes required in the state of Kansas. He goes, yeah, that's what we go by. I said, oh, you do? He goes, yeah, we have whatever state of Kansas says, that's what we do. And I said, perfect. You know, because I'm looking up state of Kansas adoption. The state of Kansas has adopted the codes. And so I said, okay, sir, I'm looking at it right here. It says, I'm looking at the Kansas page. It says that they adopt the, the this and such and such. Yeah, if that's what it says. Whatever it says right there, that's what we adopt. And I said, okay, okay, great. This is great news. I said, hey, listen, very important, very important. You may get some calls just like this from some insurance adjusters. Can you just remember to convey this to them when they do it? Um, I called that regional manager. And, you know, I would never expect this to go. I, 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 it's, it's, it's not a believable story, but I'm going to tell it to you anyway because it's true. Um, because I never expected it to happen like this. I would expect them to, you know, how are you going to correct an adjuster on something like that? Like, you're going to teach him something. Like, that's going to go really well, right? It went really, really well. The guy was open-minded, and I sat down in a much more brief period of time and shared all this stuff that I shared with you on how it actually works. That's how I approached it. Like, I told him, I said, oh, no, I understand why you're doing I was the same way. Let me share with you what I've learned, right? And I went in and, and shared it with him. And he was like, mind blown. This adjuster, because he believed me, he saw it, he got it, he connected the dots. And what he said was, it connected with him that they have to pay OL. If they have ordinance and laws, they have to pay that. And it, can, he said to me, he goes, I'll never forget, he goes, I'm just having a hard time sitting here thinking about all the times that we never paid according to code upgrades. And I'm like, well, no time's better than right now, right? Like, let's get it, let's get it fixed going forward. So I, I really... One, that's a true story, guys. Like, it's, it's a crazy story, but I think it helps to illustrate how the stuff, what the problem actually is sometimes. It's just the education. The adjusters don't understand, and a lot of times, unfortunately, the building departments don't understand. Not just in Dighton, Kansas, but in a lot of places. So if you're still stuck with them saying, like in a, in a common city, like a bigger city, uh, I've seen it a lot where they say, Nope, we've contacted the building department and they said they don't enforce the codes. If you contact the building department, my first step would be contacting the building department after that and getting the story myself, okay? Some building departments, some, not very many, are willing to put things into writing, if you can find the right guy. Um, I, I know a contractor in Round Rock, he's a former military professional kid, this is the most well-mannered, likable guy. And he's already collected like five or six of these things where he's got the building department. That I was shocked, you know, to put it in a writing. Um, but you're, not, you're probably not going to get that out of them. But so 
But if you can get the right person and get the understanding and then have the adjuster call that person. But here's another one for you. If you still can't have any success, send an email to either the city manager or the county attorney or city attorney, you know, one, the, the, um, the uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The whatever is equal to that role in that city. I can't think of the word I'm looking for. Um, Equivalent, whatever the equivalent is. Thank you. <laughs> the brain dead there. Uh, find, yeah, and send them to it and just simply ask them. Don't say a word about construction. If your email address has construction or roofing in it, use a different email address, literally. But send an email to them and, and just simply state that I'm emailing to find out if there are any of your city ordinances that you do not currently enforce. Don't tell them why you want to know. Because <laughs> the city ordinance, the building codes are under the city ordinances, those adoptions. Just are there any of your codes of your, that you have on the books that I'm looking at right here, are there any of your city codes, ordinances, that you do not enforce? Now, why would an attorney representing the city put that into writing that there are codes that they don't enforce? That's not going to happen. You're going to get an email back from, like that's actually somebody you will get an email back from. And emails are public information, you know. That's, that is actually a method that I, if you run across that, go right to that. I mean, go to the building department first, but, but go to that. It will work. Save it. Give it to your friends that work in the same town as you, right? I mean, because it's all holding the adjusters accountable. Um, trying to think of anything else uh, code-related that I haven't covered. Any questions from anybody on that? Yeah, go ahead, buddy. You're, you're screwed. Yeah. So, I'm sorry. Did I say that out loud? Yeah, you know, that's not going to work out, you know. That's why we covered it early on is that they, you have to find that early on. You know, find out if they have the RCV or ACV um, and find out if they have the OL coverage. And if they do have it, you know, I was saying earlier, have them send an email to the agent and copy you on it. And if they do have the OL coverage, ordinance and law coverage, is there anything that's excluded from that? Are there any limitations or caps. Um, you know, we saw on that one job I was showing you, or $68,000 that they covered under building code coverage. What if they had $20,000 worth of a limit, you know? So yeah, unfortunately, man, the stuff in policies where, it's, where they don't have that type of policy or they have ACV policy, you're not gonna be able to get them to pay RCV. You know what I mean? Like, the policy really is the law even when it comes to that. Pardon? What if it prevents you from getting the work done? Pa pardon? What if it prevents you from getting the work done? It just falls on the homeowner at that point? If, well, um, here's, here's the reality is that even if they don't have the building code coverage, the OL coverage, you as the contractor, if you're going to take on the work, are required to still comply. So the, the right position would be, listen, if I take on this job for you, I have to comply with all the codes and I have to charge you for it. You know what I mean? So I'm willing to make it, you know, give you a break here and there because I understand your situation. You know, you could always go down that road. But the right way is it doesn't matter um, who's covering it. I still have to be paid the full amount. And if they don't have the coverage, that means they have to pay for it. It'd be like their deductible. It'd be just like another deductible. That's correct. All right. You guys, I'm going into A bucket, B bucket, C bucket. Can you tell me how you cover that with an attorney that has an ACV policy? How you cover your ass? Do you write it down that you will pay what my contract price is? No, I, I actually, so, okay. A part, so part of my forms and documents in the course are my version of a contract, okay? I have a simple version and a detailed version, but it's in there like, we agree, like, or it says basically that we are hereby hiring Chad of Mile High Construction. <laughs> it's gotta be one of those, right? Um, mile High Construction. <laughs> We're hiring Chad of Mile High Construction to perform all repairs that are prescribed by the above reference claim, claim number such and such with State Farm for the total amount of the approved replacement cost value. Doesn't matter if it's an ACV, doesn't matter. I charge RCV. I don't then charge ACV just because they have an ACV policy. I, char I don't charge um, 5,000 less because they have a different deductible, do I? No, I, I get paid the full amount that's approved, like the RCV amount. 
So like if, if it says the approved RCV amount is this number, but they had ACV, so they subtracted a bunch of money, it's not, the, it's not the, those numbers that I'm doing the job for. No, 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 no. I'm doing the job for the total approved RCV. My opinion, just one second, my contract's in there. I don't want to fix anybody that's not broken, like you, especially if you're here part of a team and you guys have been using contracts that were you know, designed by attorneys. I don't want to screw that up. I want to get too far into that. But if you don't have contracts or you're struggling with your contract, because one of the biggest things is how do you sign a contract with a client now and then you get an approval later and then you got to go back and do another contract. There's these things out there, contingencies agree agreements. I don't do contingency agreements, guys. I don't do build contracts, okay? I, that's not my stuff. I don't do that stuff. So I, I do one contract in the beginning. I have, I, I say one, but I'm, I'm doing it one time in the beginning. Never needs to be changed ever again, okay? So I have the basic agreement in there, which is real basic. It's real simple, and it's held up on multi-million dollar jobs. How many pages? One, that's a paragraph on a page. I already told you what it says. It says, we are hereby hiring such and such as our contractor to perform all repairs that are prescribed by the claim for the total amount of the RCV. That's it, nothing else. That right there will hold up through multi-millions of dollars worth of contract. It'll hold up to a lien. It'll get, it's enough to file a lien. It's enough to file a lawsuit and really hammer them along with all your other documentation, you see, if you had to. Now, I have another one that's called an insurance contract detailed. The only difference is this one is more information where we get into like payment schedules, how you collect the money from the client, which I recommend <clears throat> the default starting point on that agreement is that all checks as they arrive turned over to us. That's the best way to do it, okay? Huh? Well, I mean, if you could, if you could get the insurance company to do that, sure. But I mean, you, no, hell no. Sorry, no, no. And that's on its way out anyway. You only got so much life on that. That's one of those easy trick fads that's here today and gone tomorrow, right? So, like me, I've been making content on video. Like I said on my YouTube back six years ago, you can go watch one of those videos right now. I promise you, every bit of it still holds true right today. It's timeless. It's obsolete. It doesn't require any tricks and special forms. That's what I think that is. It's a, it has a bad name. Adjusters don't like it. It's a, I mean, then you got You have to go sue. You have to litigate. And and how's that litigation? Is it fun, brother? Carrie? But, I mean, Carrie. How's the litigation? Is it fun? <laughs> How long does it take? Years, right? Years. Time is money. You know, so, so AOC stuff, man, it's going to take you forever to do it. Time is money. Like, I, like um, when I had my 40 employees with the landscaping company, I thought I got it back then. I didn't. I was clueless as to what time is money really means. You can measure the employees per hour. That's time is money. No. Let's say I build decks for a living, and that's all I do. I build one deck every week, same size for a builder or something. Every week, same size, same spec, same material. I use subs to do it. I use the same material. I do this one deck every week. I turn it out. It takes me a week to do it, right? I profit every time I complete one, $5,000. With me so far? So if you ask me how much I make, I could probably tell you. I could say, well, I make about $5,000 a week. That's how much I make for a living. And here's how, and I break it down for you. But you're smarter than me, and you see it before I do even, and you say, well, Chad, what happens when it rains one week and that job takes you twice as long? It takes you two weeks. How much money do I make now? I don't make $5,000 a week anymore. I make $2,500 a week. So anything that causes me to delay it and, and have AOCs and AOBs, and, and, and honestly, uh, when you go to the route of a public adjuster, it takes longer. It takes longer, right? When you go through the appraisal route, that stuff takes longer. You know, when, when you operate in the lane of the contractor, then you can get it done much faster. You know, to me, my process is I'm getting new money out of the deal in seven to 14 days. You know, that, that's, what, that's what I'm doing. Um, and you can get through it. So I, I just think you could do it the quickest time frame possible if you're, if you're using contractor options and not outsourcing it, not trying to get control of the claim and sue for it. Because that's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to go through the appraisal. You're going to have to go. And if you go through appraisal, whatever you end up with, you, that's the amount. You can't go back and get any more during the build if something else comes up, right? Like if the deck you find out 
is wet during the build, you're not gonna be able to do anything about it because you've already signed a thing that says you're not going back ever again. You know, so for lots of reasons, I don't, I don't, uh, it says it on the site to come here. It says no AOCs or AOBs required. You know, like I put that out there for anybody that thinks, oh, I'm gonna go there and he's gonna tell us we have to have AOCs, we have to go through. I don't think that at all. I I'm real old fashioned that way. It works like it did then, the way it does now. Um, all right, let's get into this A bucket, B bucket, C bucket. 